you were either leading or following Moses through the wilderness. Right. Yeah. So, church. yes. <laughs> so I, I off to church. So yeah, a funny story about Moses. Um, so because of my experience in, in the hundred mile wilderness, uh, crossing these creeks, so I, uh-huh. I told her I, I just parted the water. Um, uh, yes. I so, 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 so yeah. I mean, yeah. So, so I, I took the trail named Moses. Anything better than a trip getting ready? Nope. For a long journey where my podcast released a new app and searching for a faith feeding new, new fixation. Giving this a subscribe is the same sensation. Started with the day ones, they gave us fuel to support the season. Could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here for a reason. Notification bells, have some friends, all to let you know. Check your Bluetooth, connect, talk your wisdom. I know. Welcome in, everyone. This is Talking with Donato. Really appreciate everyone tuning in today. This is episode 47. Plateaus are the highest form of flattery. That's the name of this podcast. And our guest today is Brad Brandon. Brad, how the heck are you doing this evening? I'm doing great, Donato. Yeah, thanks. I um, uh, appreciate that that, uh, that introduction. Um, yeah, just really uh, enjoying it out here in, uh, in East Alabama. Just uh, came back from my uh, my kids' uh, wrestling match. Uh, so I, I think I had more fun watching them than, than they had fun participating. But you know, <laughs> maybe they learned something. So yeah, it's, it's always good uh, kind of hanging out with the, the wrestlers. It's uh, we, we, uh, definitely enjoy doing hard things out here and wrestling is uh, besides golf, maybe is the hardest sport oh, in, sure. in my view. So it's a, yeah. it's a great sport. I like to call it the original martial art. Uh, I, I was a wrestler in high school myself and, uh, I've got my oldest, I, I got her in uh, wrestling and, and she does pretty, pretty good. So we are, we have that in common. Uh, I spent a little time in Alabama, Brad. I was in Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, for our listeners, that's called the Tennessee Valley. And Brad, I'm going to tell you, that Tennessee Valley was amazing for me. Uh, I drove, uh, had like a, a holiday break. I, I drove my first ever vehicle I purchased, which was a Ford Mustang. I drove it from uh, Huntsville up through the Smokies and right on into Virginia. It was an amazing time. Uh, something tells me you may know a little bit about some of that area I just mentioned. Sure, yeah. I, well, I've got got some uh, friends up in uh, Hunts Vegas up there, and yeah, it's um, you know a beautiful area. Uh, so, so a little bit of family up there too. Um, really enjoy going up there and visiting, and uh, yeah, definitely just just came out of the Smokies not too long ago. Uh, but I, I was on foot. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and then uh, yeah, up, up to Virginia. Yeah. A, a little, a little more hardcore than, than my, uh, my little Mustang LX. So it was a Fox body, but you know what? I can't save this. Nothing sounds as cool as that. We're going to, we're going to get right into it. So for our listeners, if some of you may know Brad already, and you probably know what he did. And for those who don't know, Brad, something tells me that your boots were made for walking and that's just what you did. You took the Appalachian Trail? Yeah, the, the whole thing. So I started uh, on June 10th uh, up in Maine and yep. I walked down to Georgia. It took me about five months. Um, so it's uh, a total of uh, 2,200 miles uh, just about. So, yeah. Okay, well, he's here. We have him cornered, listeners. We're going to get into this because I've got a million questions. Brad, I hope you took you took a a, uh, a little energy drink, something, because I load, I'm about to load up on you. <laughs> ready, ready to go, Donato. Yeah, we're, we're past hiker midnight, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still ready to go. So. <laughs> okay, so the, the first thing, uh, Brad, what, what? What got into you? I got to know just what, where did this come about? Did you know someone that already did it? Like what, how did this enter into your mindset to do this? Right. Yeah. So I, I grew up in Atlanta, uh, which isn't very far from the, the Southern terminus of the, the Appalachian Trail in, in Dahlonega. Um, so I spent a lot of time growing up as a kid in, in the Boy Scouts, uh, a lot of weekends up on the, on the Appalachian Trail. But really... The first time that I was introduced to this was my dad. Man, I was probably like 10 years old. And, and he said, hey, there's this there's this Appalachian Trail. It goes from Georgia to Maine. It's a couple thousand miles. And you know, would you want to do it one day? I said, yeah. You know, I'm thinking he's talking about the whole thing. I think he was really talking about like three or four days. You know, so <laughs> man, I was like, yeah, that, that sounds like an amazing adventure. 
Uh, and, and one day I do want to do it. And so I, I, uh, ever since then, really, I've, I've wanted to, to do it when I kind of have that time and space uh, in my life because it does. I mean, it's hard. It's, it's five months uh, talking to a lot of people on the trail. That is really the limiting factor, right? Is It's just the time. People can do it. Um, I mean, it's, it's hard. It's difficult uh, just walking every day and being in the rain and everything. But really, it's the time factor. Uh, so I just retired from the Army. And now I've got that, got that time and space right now. And very, very lucky to have a uh, supportive family, my, my wife and my boys, to, to let me take that time uh, and, and go do my bucket list. Oh, we're going to come back. to First of all, thanks for your service. Uh, I love this country and I, I love patriots like you that defend us and in, uh, in our lifestyle. Um, Brad, wait a minute. So you were in the Army, still typically here. You guys do a lot of left, right, left, right, left, right more lefts and more rights didn't how come you didn't get that out of your system then 2200 more miles i i'm confused is right yeah so uh, one of the reasons i i think that that's the first time i was introduced to it when i was a when i was a kid uh but really i wanted to use this time uh to myself to decompress from the army i, I think i think that was that was really important um uh to to be able to kind of think about some things that, that i've done and that i haven't done or, you know, and, and kind of let that, that stuff all go. Um, but yeah, it, it is, I got that question a lot uh, on the trail. And, and really, when you're not being forced to do something, it can be pretty fun. Uh, yeah. So uh, that, that was something that I realized maybe about 800 miles or so in, is that there's no expectations out there. I can yeah. get up, uh, I can get up as late as I want to, or start as early and, and eat whatever I want when I want to. And I mean, I, I was hungry at times, but, you know, it was because I didn't want to carry the food. It wasn't, you know, yeah. like something programmed into, into training and uh, nobody was forcing me to do anything. Uh, so I could get up and walk, walk five miles, walk 20 miles. And, you know, nobody, nobody was there to say yes or no. So, um, which kind of makes it hard too. And, you know, yeah. when, when it gets, uh, the, the weather is, the weather's bad and your feet are wet and you got to put on the wet clothes again in the morning and, it's only you. Uh, it's, it's you in the trail. So uh, having that solitude, uh, being just just me in the trail. Um, there's other people out there, of course, but um, that's the way I kind of saw it. It was just just me uh, being there, being in nature, and allowing myself to decompress from uh, from the military. Okay, Brad, the, the the army's tough. There's a reason a lot of us long haired hippies don't go and do it. Because we're not built for it. I want to know what you were built for. Before this, what was the toughest road march, ruck march, hike, whatever you tough guys in the army would call it? What's the what was the toughest one you've ever done? And uh, I'd like to know wh where, when, and how you felt about that then. That, that was hard and I thought about it a lot. Yeah, I, th this is a specific instance uh, that I'll get into. So uh, I started out as a lieutenant. Yeah. Uh, I was a fire support officer. So an artillery kind of liaison between the, the, the guns and the infantry. Uh, but I was out with the light infantry. Uh, we did a, um, man, this would have been like maybe spring of 2003 in Hawaii. So on the island of Oahu, uh, back in the Kahuku training area. Um, we finished up, we were out there for like uh, maybe 10 days or two weeks, just living in the jungle and uh, doing our training and everything. And we ended that um, that training with uh, what we refer to, I'm not sure if the battalion commander thought about it this way, but we refer to it as the the Gimlet Death March. So we are the, uh, uh, the, the 121 Infantry Gimlets. And I, I think that thing, it was over 20 miles. I wanna say it was maybe 24 miles. Yeah. Um, walking, you know, roads and, we started basically like at the at the ocean, uh, the seaside, yeah. and then walked inland. So we're walking uphill the whole time. I mean that oh. I I couldn't walk for for probably a week after that. My feet were torn up, um, and I'm carrying a lot of weight too. Just yeah. you know, probably you know, sixty or eighty pounds, um, and just there's no breaks. There's no you know, it's like uh, you know, beautiful scenery, but we kind of walk by it and. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So that, that was probably the, the, the physically toughest thing that, that I did before this. 
Okay. So now that you've done this, when you look back, do you still feel that that was maybe, I, I don't think that you, you, you pushed yourself too hard on this trail, but just the perspective of it all, is that still going to rank up there as one of the toughest moments? I think so. Probably the toughest day. Yeah. Um, the, the, the toughest day of hiking, uh, that's probably a top five. Um, right. I, I have some good ones on the, uh, Appalachian Trail, especially, uh, up in Maine, uh, a little bit in New Hampshire, um, just because of, of weather conditions, yeah. uh, and really the, the terrain. So in Hawaii, it was a road march. So it's some gravel, you know, not too bad, but some of the terrain that you encounter in Maine is just, is unbelievable. Even with, you know, I probably hiked. I don't know, maybe maybe two, three hundred miles on the Appalachian Trail, kind of down in the south and in, in um, North Carolina, Georgia. But uh, up in Maine, it's a completely different animal. It's you encounter these boulder fields, just like think of boulders like the size of a house and a car and a television and a like a bowling. It's all just kind of thrown at you, and you just walk straight up this thing. So um, some days uh, I was hitting maybe. Yeah, 6,000 feet of elevation gain in a day. Yeah. Um, probably a couple of days, probably more than that. I stopped counting after a while just because it, it, you just walk. It, it, it's not going to change anything, right? If you know, uh, if it's going to be hard or, or easy, it's it just it's the trail and, and you need to walk it. So um, I, I, I want to go back to one of the things that you mentioned there. Uh, was I really wanted to save this family aspect later but i got i guess i gotta ask it now does there come a point where like you're obligated to kind of check in i don't know if you had a satellite phone or like you know did were you forced to check in maybe, maybe your 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 mate said okay once a week like how, how does that part work especially since you said you said you have a son too how's that work is it right yeah i got, got two boys uh and and my wife and and she was um she got worried there for at the the very beginning. So I, I think we, we agreed. I, we didn't really have an agreement um, uh, to check in every specific period of time. We, we didn't okay. have that set. Um, just kind of as I could. And I planned to un unplug a lot more than I actually did. Um, I, I do regret that a bit. Uh, I found myself like doom scrolling Instagram at night sometimes. Uh, <laughs> not what I went out there for. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I would, I would check in with, uh, uh, with Christina, maybe, uh, once a day at least. And a lot of that was driven by the first kind of 10 days. Uh, there was a lot of rain, an unusual amount of rain, uh, uh, and up in Maine, they don't believe in bridges. So you've got these creeks, you know, it's been raining for like, you know, two or three days and, and there's a Creek and you have to cross it. Um, yeah. And I, I was, yeah, it was probably like waist uh, to chest deep in some of these creeks. Wow. Uh, probably, probably doing some things that looking back on it were I, uh, selfish. Um, uh, just just thinking about uh, my family and the, the consequences of, of what could have happened. Sure. Uh, but I'm still here. So uh, I guess I guess it's OK. Um, but yeah, after that. So that was in the 100 mile wilderness and cell phone reception. That was really spotty. And I actually ended up like zapping my phone because I got it in the water. Um, uh, so, so I couldn't contact my wife. And uh, th there were a lot of people very concerned about the conditions. And preparing for this, I, I knew that Maine was hard and there was going to be water crossings. So I'm at these hard water crossings. I don't know. I, I just go do them. Uh, but but the, the Appalachian Trail community was really concerned for the hikers who were out there. And I had no idea because I didn't have cell phone reception. Um, so once I finally got into town, got a new cell phone, was able to contact my wife. Uh, yeah, we had an agreement like, OK, you know, once a day, just let me know you're all right. And, wow. and I did that as, as much as I could. And there were some spots where, where cell phone reception was spotty. But um, but yeah, that, that worked out. So it's not a competition, Brad. I, I know you look at me sitting here in this bow tie. For those who are just listening into the audio, I know you're thinking, now that looks like a rugged, manly man, uh, but, but it's not a competition, Brad. I, I know you're, you're, you're seeing if you could be as tough as I am, but, but Brad, I, when I travel, <laughs> I travel very heavy. 
these bow ties got to go with me. There's a bunch of luggage. And you kind of mentioned earlier that you had to make some decisions about carrying food. So, Brad, how did you make the decision on what was going on in your initial uh, rucksack, backpack? I don't even know. What, what, do you, what do you call it? What is a, a trail runner like you even call it? So, yeah, so it is a backpack um, okay. Uh, okay. that we call it. And uh, what I'm going to refer to now is, is the base weight. Uh, okay. So this is the, the stuff that we carry that, that doesn't change. Uh, so the, the weight of the pack itself, mm -hmm. uh, the sleeping bag, uh, tent. I carried a tent. Some people didn't. Um, water filter, like the, the water bottles, the cook set. Uh, I actually carried a bear canister uh, the whole time, which was probably a little bit of overkill. But uh, it, um, it's like, like a hard canister. It's about about this big. Uh, wow. that, that's what I, what I put all my food in. Um, okay. It really took up a lot of space in my pack, but also made for a good stool. Uh, so it was wow. kind of dual purpose. Um, uh, so yeah, and, and, and your clothes, uh, any extra clothes that you have. So so all of that that I had uh, combined, uh, I think my summer weight uh, was about 21 pounds. Yeah. And then you start adding all of the, the other things that, that, that can change. So uh, fuel, uh, fuel for your stove, uh, your food. Uh, and, and water. Uh, so because it was raining so much in Maine, I didn't have to carry much water. Uh, I just carried about a quart with me um, uh, for, for that that portion uh, when water was re readily available. Um, but yeah, the, the, the food, I, I would say um, the first five weeks, uh, I lost 20 or 25 pounds. And you know, I, I've, I've almost, almost put it back all on. So I, I'm not a big guy. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's um, thinking about that, you know, like if, if I want to take, you know, 25 or so weeks to do this, I'm, I'm going to be like 80 pounds when I finish. This is unsustainable. <laughs> so I started yeah. packing more food in, which mean, meant more resupplies, but I was probably carrying uh, probably three pounds of food per day. Uh, they're kind of towards the middle end of this, of this trip. So, so if I'm going to be out for, you know, four days, uh, getting close to like 35 pounds pack weight, which is like half of what I was carrying in the army. So I thought it was great, but yeah. to talk to some more experienced backpackers and 35 pounds is way, way too heavy. Um, ah. So I, I was probably on the heavier side of things. I'm also on the older side of things, which means I like my comforts. Uh, <laughs> see see yeah. some of these young kids out there carrying, you know, an extra chair or, uh, or, not, or not carrying a chair, you know, just very, very content just to kind of be uh, as light as possible and as quick as yeah. possible. Um, yeah, that's not, you know, I, I wanted to go be comfortable. So. Brad, you said that you were one of the, the few people who, who bring tits. I, I'm going to, I'm going to push this back to the young guys. What, what, why wouldn't you have a tit? That's like the first place I think I would start. It's so, right. so it's rare. So, so I think, uh, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't know if it's rare, but, um, uh, I, well, I mean, the folks I was hiking around were a little bit older too. They, they, they tended to carry tents, but some of them they, they carried a hammock, a hammock and a tarp. So that, that'll cut some weight down um, and, and it kind of gives you more options, uh, honestly. Um, uh, there the are a lot of trees on the trail, so uh, yeah. it kind of gets you up uh, out of the rocks and roots. Uh, and some people don't carry either uh, because you can stay in shelters. Uh, so every, uh, it, it depends on where you are, but you kind of every 5, 10, 15 miles or so. Uh, they have these three-sided lane to so you've got you got a roof and and three sides so at least get out of the rain yeah uh, uh you know depending on the how it's facing maybe out of the wind maybe not but um it's, yeah a lot of people will stay in the shelters i i tended not to because i think i snore and i didn't want to be that guy <laughs> keeping everybody up at night so you know, i just go crawl off to my tent and Consideration of others, CO2. Well done, <laughs> Mr. Brandt. Okay, so I, I, I got to know here, the, um, with, what's, the, what's the easiest way to say this? I'm just going to say it. Did you get lost? <laughs> there were a few times. I, I wouldn't say that I was lost. I mean, but I was <laughs> off the trail. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. th there, there were a couple of times. So up, up in Maine, uh, just the, the, the way that the, the trail is, it's very, um, 
shoot, I, I'm losing the term right now, but it's, it's a bunch of like, like pine trees and the, the roots are all above ground. There's a lot of moss. You don't have this very well beaten path. And there were some times I kind of veered off and uh, the, the trail got a little bit soft and it was, I hadn't seen a blaze. So that, that's how they marked the Appalachian Trail is a, a white blaze. It's kind of two by five inches on about, about eye height uh, on a tree. And I hadn't seen one. And I'm, I'm kind of there in the woods and I don't really see the trail. And I, I would turn around and then I, I actually did see one uh, kind of, oh. kind of on back. So, so I was able to stop myself. Um, th there are some spots in uh, New Hampshire that the trail is very poorly marked. Yeah. Uh, and you get up on, on these balds, these just absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it's just all uh, uh, granite, I believe, but uh, just these rocky balds. And you're enjoying the view, and then all of a sudden, like you can't find a blaze. Huh. Uh, so it's it, you're kind of wondering which uh, which direction uh, to go. Um, but now that I'm thinking about it, uh, yeah, it, this is probably one of the most uh, impactful days on the trail for me. Um, actually, I, I sent you a picture that the the one where I look absolutely miserable. That was about the end. Of the day. <laughs> so yeah, that's the first thing I thought when I saw the pic. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was it was a good day. So I started out. Um, uh, it was it was raining a little bit uh, in the morning, and I knew it was going to rain. So I was trying to get all my stuff packed up uh, before it started raining to, to keep my sleeping bag and, and my clothes dry. And uh, got got loaded up and started hiking up uh, Bigelow Mountain. It, it's it's really the first like tough climb if you're heading southbound, mm -hmm. and got up to, to little Bigelow and I got halfway up. Maybe I, I took a break in the morning, just a little snack break. And it just started raining too. So, you know, I get out of the rain for 20 to 30 minutes, had a little snack. Um, and I kept walking up the mountain and I got up to the top of, of little Bigelow, uh, which is a flat mountain. Uh, the, the mountaintop is flat. I, I got up there, uh, had a little snack, um, looked at the white blaze, had my snack, looked at that white blaze again and started walking for some reason, the opposite direction. Oh, and man. the trail went down and it went down. And I, when's this gonna level off? And that's the question I was asking myself. When, when's this gonna like level off? And I got all the way back down to that shelter where I took a break. It was like two miles. Oh. And it was supposed to be a short day too. It was supposed to be like a 12 mile day or something. Um, and I got, got all the way back down to that shelter. I thought I was in the twilight zone, right? Just like, yeah. I see the sign pointing to the shelter. He's like, wait, how did this even happen? And, and it, so I, I figured it out. I walked back up, up the hill, um, got up to the top and I saw that blaze that I looked at and it was, it was a directional blaze. So it was kicking me to the right and I, I just missed it. Oh. And yeah, once I got past that, it was nice and flat. And then up on top of Bigelow Mountain, the winds were like 50 miles an hour and just ran sideways. And yeah, it was it was a fun day. Um, I, I took a little little mental health break uh, the next day. I, uh, that, that was that was one night I stayed in the shelter. I stayed in that shelter two nights uh, just to kind of uh, recover and uh, rethink things. Okay, when you're out there, I'm sure there's a bunch of people. You know, I I. I guess you're carrying a map or, you know, you scouted some things out and you're looking at it and you say, okay, why can't this be a straight line? I got to go this long, long way to the right or to the left. How many times did you think, man, I'm smarter than, I'm smarter than, than this path. I, I, I can make my own path because it sounded like you might've mentioned that earlier that you weren't lost. So did that happen? Did you think that you were smarter than the trail and, and veered off intentionally? No, uh, no. And if, uh, yeah, any of my um, uh, hiking partners out there see this, I mean, they know I am an absolute purist. Oh. I walked by every white blaze. So, <laughs> so there's kind of, uh, uh, you know, there's some, some controversy in the, in the through hiking community about uh, how one should hike the trail. And you know, we have a saying called hike your own hike. And yeah. so, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I don't, if, if you want to take side trails or do your own way, did you hike from Maine to Georgia? Yeah. Okay. You know, I, that, that is quite an accomplishment, no matter how you do it. Uh, but, but for me personally, I, I wanted to walk by every white blaze. Um, okay. So no, I, I didn't, um, uh, never deviated. 
Uh, that included crossing the creeks when I shouldn't be crossing. Oh. You know, so um, just, uh, uh, yeah, very strict uh, in my approach. Um, and, yeah, I, I didn't, I never really felt like that. And, and the, the trail does meander a lot. It, it's, okay. it's not a straight line from, uh, from Maine to Georgia. It kind of, it's not south even. Like even Pennsylvania goes from, from east to west. What? It, it hardly even goes south. Uh, so, but it's it's the trail, and and you know for me that's just uh, that's that's something I can't do anything about. So I don't worry about it. I just say okay, that here's here's the trail today, and um, I, I'm going to enjoy it, and I'm going to find something uh, that I like about every day. Huh? Just, I know you wouldn't have the exact, but let's just say sixty uh, percent of the time you accomplished your goals. It sounded like one time you were saying that it was a light day. So you were only going to do 12 miles that day. So let's just say, you know, when you started, you thought, you know what, I'm averaging 15 miles a day. Uh, how many times, what's that percentage of times that you actually made it the distance you were expecting for a day? I'd say, I mean, over 90%. Oh, um, what? Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, but, you know, I, I, I handicapped myself too. Uh, it, uh, so in the beginning, I was only planning on doing like 10 mile days. Um, okay. And so I, I, I got in there and I started actually doing more than that. Um, but yeah, I, I think once I got out of New England uh, and New Hampshire in particular uh, with, with the high water and, uh, and all that, yeah, I, I was, I was making, I, some days I, I would do more uh, than right. I expected. Um uh, but yeah, as I, I would say almost all the time, uh, but, but sometimes it just weather conditions, uh, would slow me down there. And there were a couple of times up in, uh, Maine and New Hampshire where the trail was just too hard and I had to, had to scale it back. Uh, but it's when you're only carrying four days worth of food, you know, it's pretty easy to, to, to make that, make that next food stop. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. I mean, it, it may not be easy, but you've got pretty good motivation. You mentioned a little bit about the sites. Uh, I used to live in, in uh, Boston, Mass for a while. I did some motorcycle riding up into Maine. And I always like to take anyone that's never been in New England in that area to see maple syrup trees. Did you have any experiences, uh, one, with that? And then the second question I'd like you to answer is, what, what impressed you? Like what was what was that one moment? If it wasn't the maple trees, like what was the thing that impressed you? So those are the two questions. Thanks. Yeah, those are, those are great questions. I, I did have experience with the maple trees, and the, the first time I saw it, I, I didn't know I didn't know what it was. Like I I actually have a degree in forestry, so I know maple trees. Yeah. Uh, and and when I was in Virginia, um, or I'm sorry, Vermont, um, uh, I did have uh, you know I, I recognized I was hiking through through uh, you know maple plantations. I guess. Yeah. Um, that they still had the, their leaves on the trees and everything. And, um, but I saw these, I could, it looked like it was like fenced off, but I, I went, I, once I got close to it, I, there were hoses connecting all the taps together. Yes. And I guess it ran down to a collection point. And so, yeah, I, I thought that, that was, that was pretty cool to, to be able to see, you know, this, this is where they're making the maple syrup. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, and then what was the what was the one thing you you remember saying to yourself, man, this is beautiful. Like I'm I'm curious of that. Yeah, I, I think um, it was uh, right at uh, peak leaf season. Uh, I was up on Max Patch, so so this is just north of the Smoky Mountains a little bit. Okay. In uh, in North Carolina, and it was a um, yeah, just a, a really special day. Uh, yeah, because I, I was, um, it was the only, uh, the only backpacking trip that I ever quit. Uh, it was with my dad. I was maybe, I think I was like 17 years old or so. And, and we uh, we were in Hot Springs. And this was like, uh, like 1997 or something. Uh, we were in Hot Springs. We were supposed to go up to Max Patch. We'd been hiking for a couple of days and just, it was, it was cold. And it was, the mountains are tough up there. It's, oh. it's um, uh, surprisingly difficult uh just looking at it, you know, it's not, it's not the Sierra, it's not the Rockies, right. But it's, it's difficult terrain. And uh, we were just getting beat up, didn't have our trail legs. And we got a hot lunch in hot springs. 
And that was it. So we, we decided it was time to go home. Um, <laughs> but this time I was going to do it. I, I stopped in Hot Springs and and had my hot lunch and I, I kept walking. Um, oh. And it made it to Max Pass. So th this is one of these uh, bald areas. Um, and I could see the Smoky Mountains off in the distance. But really, the way I described it, it was like, it's like I was walking in a picture. I was, it was beautiful fall colors. I just, and the weather was just amazing that day too. Wow. And, and walking towards the Smokies and being able to see all, all the leaves and, and really to see the ridgeline where I was going, going to be hiking in a couple of days. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, that really made a big impression on me. That was probably one of my favorite kind of spots uh, on the trail for me. All right, there's a bunch of city slickers that are going to be listening to this out of curiosity. Um, oh, by the way, you're not the only person I know with a uh, an undergrad in forestry. Uh, shout out to Aaron Carpenter. He can't wait for me to upload this, so this is going up tonight. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I don't, Brad. I don't think he's listening to any of my other podcasts. I told him about you, and uh, <laughs> he's going to beat my door down for the city slickers. I know that they automatically believe that you came across four meth labs and about 10 or 12 moonshine, I don't even know what they're called, moonshine hooches. Stills, yeah. 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 What, what, what say you? Uh, no, none of that. I came across some people who uh, uh, partook in organic uh, mind-altering substances <laughs> um, but yeah, nothing, uh, nothing like that. I mean, the, the trail is really, um, I, you meet some, some interesting folks out there, but most everybody is, you know, I, I, you wouldn't recognize them as being any different if you saw them on the street. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you, you do meet some interesting folks out there. Uh, but, but it's very safe. I mean, hikers are, you know, all of us to, to an extent are out there just to, just to be out in nature, uh, meet some other people and, and, do some difficult uh, things. So just just challenge ourselves. Um, but yeah, never <laughs> never saw any uh, any meth labs or anything. Um, uh, yeah, but it's um, it, it, some of the towns. You know, it's you can tell it's uh, the, the the socioeconomic uh, factors there. It's definitely having an impact. Yeah, um, so, some poor areas. Um, uh, but, but just beautiful, man. As you know, I I, I hope when I, when I was in Asheville, uh, uh, which is kind of a, a well-to-do area, but you know, yeah. th there's tons of uh, poor areas around there. And I was thinking, it's like, man, I I hope the people who live here like understand and appreciate just how beautiful this is. Yeah. Um, it's just a beautiful area of the country, and um, you know, and, and people are making make and do with what they have. But it, mm -hmm. at least, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you're in the mountains. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You being a gentleman of a forestry background, as I al already mentioned, you get out there. Can you get distracted? Like, can, can you, can you actually say, wow, that's a, well, Sorry, I, I don't. I don't have a forestry background. That's a pine tree. That's a. That's a. That's a. That's a Brad tree. I'm just making it up. Like, it, yeah. Can you enjoy it, or you were so focused? I, I mean, it sounds like you enjoyed some of the views here and there, but could you like enjoy it? Could you? Could you geek out? Yes, absolutely. Oh. So yeah. So so boreal. Boreal pine forest is what I was thinking of in, in Maine. Uh, that, that's yeah. that's a um, it's kind of an alpine, uh, cold weather uh, environment. And it's very different from the the pine forest that we have down south. Oh. Um, so so that that was fun. But I'm not super familiar with that because I, I went to school at Auburn and I learned you know about like loblolly and, and longleaf pines that we have down here in the south. So uh, oh. I wasn't able to really identify. But I remember coming into well, two things I remember when. Um, uh, coming into Massachusetts, yeah, I, I saw that that's where it changed from like this, this kind of a boreal environment to more of a, a pine oak mix, which is what I'm used to. So that's when I started identifying uh, the black cherries, um, yeah. uh, starting to see more maple trees. Um, and the the one tree that I saw that, that really struck me was uh, an American chestnut. So th they they died off, really kind of like stunted growth. 
um, years ago. They used to be just these majestic trees, uh, you know, almost like the redwoods out out west. Whoa. And and they all died off, um, and the, they have really stunted growth. So the tallest one I had seen, uh, kind of growing up in in the southeast, was maybe like waist high. And I saw one that was like twelve feet tall. So what? they're starting starting to recover from this from this blight uh, that stunts their growth. Um, and I, I saw some that were you know maybe like four inches around, uh, yeah. kind of in Virginia. So th that was one tree that I identified that I thought was really cool. And then yeah. when I got down to uh, Virginia, I remember seeing my first sourwood tree. Uh, because, yeah, it's uh, like it, it's just a. This is the the, the really nerdy forestry part of me. Is oh, I, oh. I will rip those leaves off and and eat them because uh, it, it tastes like it's like a sour patch kit. Uh, so oh. just kind of something to do. It's really it's a sour wood, but the the taste of the leaves is sour as well. Uh, so you can kind of kind of chew on those as you go and. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so uh, but absolutely, I was I was identifying trees. Um, <laughs> tripped a couple of times because I was getting distracted. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, that's that's when you're into it. So right, I'm like yeah. with you on that. Man, that's so cool. All right, uh, let, let's get to let's get to clothing. Let's get to hygiene, and this is where I lose him. Up until now, he was enjoying the time, but he's like, "Come on." But you had to know this was coming. So yeah. the first thing, the clothing. How many pairs of boots did you go through? Were you I went through, uh, well, I, I ended up with, with five pairs of boots. Uh -huh. um, so Pennsylvania alone accounted for one of those. Um, yeah. and, and the start kind of through the, the Maine and the White Mountains in New Hampshire, uh, that ate another pair. Um, yeah, so I went through five pairs of boots uh, total. And just, I... Some of those rocks would it was like like take chunks out of the out of the soul. Um, yeah, it was it was pretty extreme. Okay, um, I'm not I'm not sponsored by anybody, but and I'm a city boy. Brad, what's the best daggone boot then? Like what what did you settle on as your boot of choice? So yeah, I, I the whole time I used uh, Merrill Moabs. Um, they're kind of a, a a three quarter boot. And yeah, you know, again, I'm, I, I'm an old guy, my feet hurt. So I was odd in that I wore boots. And this is what I'd say, almost nobody wears boots uh, when they're through hiking the trail. They, they, will, tra uh, they will wear trail runners. Um, and those for me just don't offer support. Um, and the, the soles are not thick enough uh, to get over those rocks. But the, the theory is that they dry out fast. So you're always gonna, at some point you're gonna encounter rain or creek crossings on the trail. So um, my disadvantage, it, it took my boots a while to dry out. Um, but if you're in a trail runner, it, it you know, it, it's almost instantly when it dries out. Brad, don't, don't you have to protect your ankles? What, I mean, I play a pickup basketball a couple times a week. Uh, I wear high tops. I, I don't get it. I Don't you got to protect the ankles? With, it's, with yeah, I, that was... Um, that was my thinking too. I, so even from uh, just actually like impacting the rocks uh, when you get in there and you slide off a rock and you hit another yeah. one um, or, or for me a little bit clumsy, like at my, my trekking poles, I, I bang my feet every now and then. So I can't imagine being in a trail runner. Um, yeah, but people do it. And I, I don't know, I guess part of the theory too is it, it's a lighter shoe. So, yeah. Yeah. so when you're moving your legs, it, it's, it's moving less weight. And when you're taking 5 million steps, Hiking two thousand miles, I, I guess it adds up after a while. Um, oh my god, it, I I didn't even realize that. Man, five million steps is about the total of what you did there. That that's what they say. Yeah, I didn't count. Oh, um, but yeah, I think that that's that, that's the uh, kind of the, the general theory is that when you hike it, you're taking about five million steps. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to pull back to the clothing. All right. So you started out with a, with a, 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 an assortment of clothes. Did you go through all of that stuff and then had to stop and buy new stuff for the remainder of your time? How'd that go? I, I did. Yeah. So I started off with, uh, so I had my, my hiking set of clothes. Yeah. Uh, so it was a, um, uh, I think, what was it like a, a, a nylon shirt? So it's a synthetic shirt. Uh, nylon pants, hiking pants, which a lot of people hike in shorts too. I don't like it because I don't like the, the all the the 
leaves and stuff brushing on my legs. Sure. Um, uh, one pair of socks uh, that I would wear. And then I had like a uh, kind of a cold weather uh, running shirt uh, just in case it got, it got cold. And I had a, a, a down puffy jacket, rain gear. I don't remember wearing my rain pants actually on the trail ever. Um, uh, but the, the rain jacket I would wear sometimes. Uh, so, so that's what I would wear. Um, and then I had a, a sleeping set of clothes too, just to kind of keep my sleeping bag. Cause I, that, that stuff gets like gross, all muddy and sweaty. Um, so at night I would change into my sleeping clothes, which was essentially a set of long johns, uh, yeah. and, and a pair of socks. Uh, so I had, th that's kind of what I, what I carried, uh, in my pack every day. Um, I did change out my uh my hiking clothes it was the same thing essentially but i just dropped a size because i was yeah. losing weight uh <laughs> because i went from a medium shirt to a small and then a 34 to a 32 to a 30 inch waist on my pants um went through a couple pair of socks yeah. uh and then when it started getting colder i upgraded my um my long underwear for my sleeping oh. so yeah I, I guess i actually like i replaced every piece of clothing that i had <laughs> yeah Except for the puffy jacket. The puffy jacket survived. Yeah. All right. I I think as we talk, I I see it. You didn't want to admit to it. Here's the theory I've already worked out. Uh, you were in Maine at a casino. You went into a negative <laughs> amount of money. The mafiosos were after you. And that's why you started to hike your way home. That's how you lost them. Am I close? By that you know, um, yeah, it's you know, it's all those funny. I mean, you're from Boston, right? So I mean, yeah, yeah. all that that kind of that scene uh, that, that flows through the the Northeast, <laughs> and really, it was I I got I got in bad with the lobster guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's uh, when you're dealing with a mafia, like a, a lobster roll isn't something you want to eat. So no, no. I don't want to be part of the lobster roll. So. <laughs> Yeah. That's good. That's awesome. Oh, oh, yeah. So that that almost brings me to a point where um, it, it doesn't sound like you had a chance to get coastal, right? You're you're inland the whole time, but any any lakes, any amazing rivers that you came across that some of us may have heard of, may not understand that you kind of went across. I mean, I I I don't mind looking ignorant here. Like we know about the mighty Mississippi, but was there anything there that that you liked, that you saw? Sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, starting off in Maine, uh, just w when I did have a view uh, uh -huh. from from those mountaintops, I just, and walking by it, by ponds and, and lakes, it just, there's so much water in Maine. Um, wow. th that was really, really amazing. Uh, but the first really kind of uh, famous river uh, that you cross is in Maine, and it's, it's the Kennebec. Uh, okay. so famous for, you know, like Kennebec port, uh, where, where the presidents go that take, their, oh, yeah. but, but that, that's down on the coast. Right. So we're, uh, we're way far inland, but the, the Kennebec is really a, uh, a, a great whitewater, um, river. So I'm told I, I didn't get to experience that, but that that's a neat river crossing. It's the only part of the trail, uh, where you can't walk it. Um, and they have a canoe. Uh, that comes take that comes to take you across, and they actually have a white blaze painted on the front of that canoe. Uh, so, oh, wow. so you're small on the trail. So, so for guys like me who only want to walk by the white blazes, so uh, to, to get us in that canoe instead of because I mean that's really a that's a deep river. It's got it got current. I mean it, when it's low, it's like kind of shoulder high. So wow. and there's a dam upstream, so that they don't want people getting in that water. So yeah, yeah. there's a guy who comes out from uh, you know fairly early in the morning until the, the afternoon. Uh, and he'll he'll ferry you across the river. Um, How uh, long so are you, yeah, are you on that canoe? Oh, it's a couple of minutes, so maybe like five minutes. Okay. okay. So yeah, it's it's a good sized river, um, but but yeah, not not crazy, not, not a lot of time. Um, uh, so that one, um, so probably the next. I'm probably missing something here, but um, uh, apologies to everybody from the the Northeast, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, the Shenandoah River. Uh, oh, across yeah. in, in, in Harper's Ferry, which is a very historical town too. Yes, uh, with old John Brown there, and uh, uh -huh. um, yeah, that that's a that's one of the, the the best views I think. And I got it, it was super misty uh, looking over the and the Potomac. Uh, so uh, depending on how you do, I, I crossed it two different days, but I crossed the Potomac, hit Harper's Ferry, and then across the Shenandoah, and all kind of within about five miles. 
Um, yeah, and, and walk down the, the Shenandoah Valley. Um, and yeah, I, I guess the I, I'm, I'm probably missing something again here in Virginia because we spent about 500 miles in Virginia. Yeah. Um, uh, but but I got to mention that the Chattahoochee is being being from Georgia originally. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And there it's just this very small um, uh, spring that comes. It's the headwaters of the Chattahoochee. It just is this little trickle that comes out from under a rock, uh -huh. uh, and that's that, that's where that river starts. Whoa. Um, I mean that 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 sounds cool just in itself. Uh, I, you know, I'll take your word for it. I might, I might uh, look it up, <laughs> but just to know that's the headwater is pretty cool. Yeah, I, I've spent a lot of time down in Georgia, so that's that's cool. Uh, now, I, I, I'm not even sure. Uh, you named a couple big, big um, landmarks. Um, any amazing bridges that you kind of went across, and you're like, this is a beautiful bridge. I'm thinking like up in the Northeast, you, you got where they call like uh, house bridges. Uh, it, it looks like a like a like a garage is on top of a bridge. Any cool bridges? Is it right? Yeah. What what is that? I think it's the, the Connecticut River that, that runs between uh, New Hampshire and uh, Vermont uh, across that one. I, I would say that that one not not like you're talking about. Not like one of these covered bridges. Oh, um, there it is. Yeah. Didn't cross any of those, uh, but yeah, a really uh, aesthetically pleasing kind of from afar. It's got, got a bunch of arches and it's kind of got got some gold adornments on it. Um, I did like that one. Um, not a particularly pleasant bridge. I think it's I eighty eight that crosses, but but crossing the Delaware as as another you know kind oh. of famous river that I forgot to cross. Yes, it is. Uh, yes, <laughs> between um, uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Uh, uh -huh. So coming out of New Jersey into Pennsylvania across that, uh, yeah, again, not a super, uh, super aesthetically pleasing bridge, but but that river, it was, it was cool to cross that. Hey, you just helped the rest of us, those of us who want to avoid those tolls on I-95 when they're in that Delaware corridor. <laughs> is, yeah. <laughs> That's got the back roads there. <laughs> yeah. Um, get around those toll boots. Is, yeah. So I would. There was a suspension bridge. Uh, it was. It was in Pennsylvania. I, I, I wish I could. I wish I could remember the name. Of it. it was. It was really. Um, uh, I've got my pictures. I might be able to pull it up here. But yeah, it was really um, across a few suspension bridges. Um, what are you talking about and that. Yeah, that that, that was neat. Um, yeah. You know, and, and a lot of them are built for the hikers. It's it's not like, you know, that the, there were old bridges that, that took cars or on them or anything that. I'd, you know, the, the local hiking clubs uh, funded that and, uh -huh. and built a bridge to, to get us over those dangerous water crossings. Wow. So may, may, maybe the folks in Maine are taking notes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when will they organize? Those are right. right. <laughs> to help guys out. How tall are you, Brad? Uh, was, I, I'm, I'm five foot nine. Oh, yeah, you're, so you're not that tall. Like, no. You're, well, I, you're six, six. You're six, seven. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, uh, I, I went to school on forestry scholarship, not basketball. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> see, <laughs> no, because uh, uh, when you said that you were in waters, I'm five five. I can round up to five six because I'm five five and a half. But sheesh, you lost me when you were saying chest high waters. Nope. There's a there's a height requirement for this trail. <laughs> it's right, yeah, and I I would say that 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 was uh, some very very unusual conditions. Okay, uh, that, that we had to go through, and it was it was really for a very short period of time. It just happened to be when I was up there. Um, but yeah, usually like those those creeks when they get up to like waist high, that's high. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, getting it into belly and, and chest is is really really extreme. Um, uh, folks were saying it, there's been nothing like that in the last 20 years. Um, most of the, most time when you hit in the summer, like you don't even get your feet wet. And a lot of these creeks, uh, you can just rock hop uh, yeah. across the river and you don't even have to, to get your feet in the water. Um, but yeah, that, that was it's not the case for me. Maybe if I had waited a couple of days, uh, let, let the water go down, I would have had a, uh, a safer experience. But yeah, I, I think that's, um, I, I don't want to scare anybody off. You know, it's... Sure. Uh, yeah, very unusual conditions. So most of the time, it's much easier. 
Okay, now I got to go back to another one of these questions that I, I, I know you're going to cringe when I ask, but hey, this is the expose. You know, when I, for listeners, I told Brad, this is going to all, this is going to be, you know, this is a layup kind of a podcast. Here's the hard hitting stuff. Brad, who's the most colorful or memorable person you came across on that trail? It was Scuba Steve. It was it was Scuba Steve. Scuba Steve. I ran into him late, kind of in in Southern Virginia, uh-huh. and, and th- this guy uh, was just uh, just a character. Just um, uh, didn't care. I mean, you know, I mean, just just like in, in, in a very like like good way and a funny way. You know, just um, absolutely didn't care what people thought about him, and it would just. Um, uh, just, just a funny guy. I mean, very, very colorful, uh, but, but very nice. I mean, just, just one of the nicest guys I, I, I met. And, um, but he was always kind of just like kind of getting himself into, into little situations. Um, <laughs> uh, so we, I was with a couple other guys, uh, Step and, and Moses. Um, uh, we were in, in Parisburg, uh, Virginia, and we, we were actually on our way to a, a Church of Christ picnic um, because, you know, it had been a while since we went to church and, and we were hungry. Uh, so uh, we, we loaded up in the car and um, uh, went over and, and we took a, a zero day. So so all these days I was out hiking. I, I took a few days off uh, right. just where I hiked. I, 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 I intended to hike zero miles. So uh, a zero day. Um, uh, we, we went over to this church picnic and look around the corner. It's like, there's Scuba Steve walking <laughs> down the road. Like, that's not where the trail goes. So we, we grabbed him <laughs> up and it's like, hey man, guess what? You're coming to church with us. And um, uh, so, yeah, we, we got him. And um, I tell you that uh, we, we got him in the car and he uh-huh. was telling us a story about what happened last night. Um, oh. And he came in, so you know, from from army experience, right? We, we use red lights, and we use red lights on the trail too, just because you can kind of preserves your night vision and it's, okay. it's uh, more considerate to other people. So if you're sure. around, and um, and when we're out there, we encounter all sorts of people, right? So so there, there's through hikers uh, like us who will hike all 2,200 or so miles. Um, and then you have some section hikers, so po- folks who'll be out, you know, maybe maybe for a weekend maybe a week, maybe a month, you know, um, yeah. and then you have our, the, the day hikers. So, so you get section hikers camping, um, uh, camping with us and, and scuba Steve, uh, came in one night, uh, with his white light late, you know, it's, it's after dark. He's, he's, he's got his white light on. I, yeah. I, I think scuba Steve thinks that he's alone. And so, so scuba Steve is telling us a story and he's like, yeah, I'm shining my light and, and all, um, and I see the, these tents and, and I'm sitting on my tent and, you know, it's late and everything. And, and this section hiker comes out and just starts to like yelling at me. He was like cussing at him. It's like, turn off your white light, you know, just like we're trying to sleep over here. We had heard that same story from some through hikers like an hour before that. <laughs> I, we, like, but it was, it was those section hikers who were telling us a story about Scuba Steve and they knew it was Scuba Steve. Uh-huh. And so, uh, yeah. So after church, we kind of uh, brought brought the two parties together and let them let them work it out. Yeah. Uh, so it was. Uh, yeah, that, that was a memorable moment. And then, um, yeah, it kind of it kind of got, got got rough with them a little bit. But as um, we, uh, uh, you know, call, called them stinging the policeman. It's like, hey, dude, Roxanne, you don't have to put on a red light. <laughs> and, and, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that kind of became a, a moniker um, uh, for him. He, he was a good sport to uh, uh, to let us kind of kind of ride that out. Um, let's let's back up, Brad. Uh, did you just say you were either leading or following Moses through the wilderness? Right. Yeah. So <laughs> yes. So I, I off to church. So yeah, a funny story about Moses. Um, so because of my experience in, in the hundred mile wilderness, uh, crossing these creeks, like I couldn't tell my wife what I was actually doing right when I called her. So I, uh-huh. I told her I, I just parted the waters. Um, uh, yes. 
I so, so, so yeah, I mean, just, <laughs> yeah. So so I, I took the trail name Moses, okay. and then and then about a week, uh, a week into that, I was I was at a hostel where they um, uh, was at the main roadhouse. So they they take a Polaroid of all the through hikers who come through, and I saw this other guy Moses who was like a week ahead of me. Uh-huh. I, like oh, and, and I just like chosen to to go by the trail named Moses. Like oh man, now there's this. So so for like fifteen hundred miles, I would meet people and they say, oh yeah, I met another Moses too. It's like well, I want to be the first Moses. So I, I got to pass this guy at some point. And um, but but it became um, a, a little bit uh, like logistically challenging. And, and actually, Parisburg, where where we went to church, uh, uh, I called to make a reservation of that hostel. And they said, oh, yeah, Moses, yeah, you're coming in on this. It's like, no, no, different Moses. So I had to, like, go go by a, another name. So I started going by Chopped Moses. I had these big, these big <laughs> mutton chops. So I, yeah. I let him keep the because he, he was the original Moses. So I started going by Chopped Moses. Yeah. Uh, just to, to differentiate. But, but yeah, I was I was hiking with Moses in the wilderness um, uh, for, for, for a good while there. And he, he was, he was cool. Um, uh, an awesome guy, uh, super laid back. And, um, he brought with him like a, a ram's horn, like they called a, a shofar. Oh. Uh, and, and he would blow that thing, uh, get up on a, a nice vista and uh-huh. kind of down the valleys and, and hit, hit the shofar. And uh, just, it was an amazing sound to hear. Um, yeah, I, I, I miss that. That's actually one of the things of the trail I miss <laughs> is hearing that. So. I know that. Sorry, we're we're in the last few minutes here. Uh, we may have to do a part two. I mean, you can't get twenty two hundred right. miles in one hour here, so yeah. uh, that's a threat to you, Mr. Brandon. <laughs> but, uh, no, it's, it's an opportunity, man. Yeah, bring it. Yeah. Sheesh, that I I still have so much more. But okay, are 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 you now at a point where you're okay with maybe even admitting? There was some regret during the trail. At, I'm not saying you're a quitter, but you know, was was there a point where you're like, "crap, this was a bad idea," or never again? At least at, you said it at that moment. Did that ever happen? I would say, uh, um, not not regret, but a, uh, a a feeling of doom that I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, oh. uh, so, and, and I, I thought about quitting. Uh, early on, uh, when I was up in Maine, so it, it, there, there was about 30 days there uh, in a row where I was hiking in wet boots. Yeah, you know, just think about the the um, you know having to get up every morning and put on wet socks and put on those boots, and uh, and I'd get them dried out sometimes, uh, but then like you know the, the next day I have to cross a creek, uh, you know, like a knee high creek. Um, n- nothing, nothing too crazy at that point. Um, but yeah, so and just the it really did some some pretty good damage just to the skin on my feet yeah. and it made it very painful to walk um and it, and it rained you know it wasn't raining all the time but it was it rain every you know 3 days or so and um it, it was it was just it was just hard and the, the the terrain was hard I was walking over roots and like slipping dangerous conditions wet slippery and, and I really thought I was like can I can I do this anymore yeah. Um, and it, it was really nice. Actually, my, my, my best man and his wife came up. Um, it, it just kind of happened to be that they were up in Maine, uh, kind of when I was in Maine and, oh. and they wanted to visit and I made a stop that I wasn't planning on making. So I pulled into to Bethel, uh, Bethel, Maine and took, uh, you know, about 12, 18 hours off the trail that I wasn't planning on doing. And, and my body, and my mind needed that. Oh. Um, so I, I wouldn't say at, at no point did I regret uh, what I was doing, but I mean, really thinking about like, should I still be out here doing this? Because I don't know if I can, uh, yeah. that definitely hit me, you know, maybe, maybe two, 300 miles in. Um, but yeah, I got my, got my spirits up and my, my feet in a better condition, <laughs> not, not completely <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, better. And, um, yeah, I was able to uh, I was able to keep going after that, and after that, like I, I never, um, 
really is after I crossed Mount Washington. So Mount Washington has some of the worst weather in the United States. It's, I think it's the second highest peak on, on the trail. It's, it's over 6,000 feet. And um, being able to, to summit that and knowing that it's one of the hardest things to do on the trail. Um, and then after that, I was like, there's absolutely nothing that could stop me. Um, yeah. And the, the, it was it was all, all fun and games after that. <laughs> I'll have two questions left, Brad. This this has been amazing. I'm geeking out. I know Aaron's going to geek out. And then, uh, yeah, I even hope that some of your uh, your peers that you either met or, or uh, your acquaintances, I'm very curious of, of their thoughts on this, too. So we'll need to keep in touch. I'd love to hear their feedback. Uh, okay, so. When you get to the end, this is the first question. When you get to the end, do you start to quicken the pace? Do you get a little impatient or do you slow down because you could see the end? You're over the mountaintop. That was an intentional pun there. And you just kind of just want to slow down and enjoy these last 100 miles or 80 miles. Which which one are of the two? I would um... – so I, I did see a lot of my, uh, I wouldn't say a lot. I mean, I, I think that there were some people who kind of kept the same pace, but, but there's definitely an urgency uh, to get done. Uh, for me, I, I wanted to finish with my family. So I actually finished with, um, uh, my mom and dad came out and, uh, and my wife and two boys came out. Uh, and we had, because they don't, they're in school and they work and stuff. So it had to be on a weekend and they, my boys actually run cross country too. So it had to be you know, on kind of a specific date, uh, yeah. that, that we had lined up. So November 12th uh, was that day. Um, so that, that's the day that I wanted to finish. Um, and so, so that was good for me because I, I couldn't go any faster. Um, and really it, it, it forced me to slow down because I probably could have finished a week. Uh, or maybe even sooner before I finished. Um, yeah. But that really forced me to, or I shouldn't say forced, it gave me that opportunity to slow down and uh, really enjoy. God, I was there in the fall. I, I was hiking through the fall for like a, since September 3rd. So it was like the, yeah. a full like half of the trail, um, uh, half of my time on the trail. I was, I was hiking through the fall. So uh, getting to experience that in, in Georgia and through the Smokies and uh -huh. Just, just taking my time, and um, I don't think I took any days off, but I took some short days. Uh, definitely took some short days through Georgia, uh, mm -hmm. spending nights at, at places where I'd been before, and kind of revisiting those old places, and really t taking that time just to a little bit of extra time to sit on those mountaintops mm -hmm. and, and really enjoy it. Last question: I always ask. Uh, the guests, uh, you've been an amazing one. This this has been intriguing. Um, I believe in six degrees of separation. And so, Brad, I always ask, who's the most interesting person that you know? And what will you do to help me get them on this podcast? They don't have to be famous. They don't have to be rich. I said interesting. And your definition of interesting interesting person I know. I like it. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I know no, a bunch I, of interesting people. So, yeah. No, uh, no, I, yeah. I, I, um, if you didn't have one ready that you got to kind of whittle through them. I, I, I like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, man. Who, who would I say? Man, I want to say like Dan Robinson. Who's that, that that guy, the, the, he's he's um, uh, an army buddy of mine who I served uh -huh. in, in Thailand with. Um, he's actually one of these Hunts of Vegas people too. So yeah. he, yeah, just a, a great family guy, loves his country. And uh, um, yeah, he's always doing something, some kind of wild. So yeah. Oh. <laughs> you got me there. Yeah. <laughs> so that so the second part of that's what will you do? Will you put in a word? Will you implore them that, hey man, I think you should uh have a little conversation with Donato? What will you do to help me? Yeah, well I, I can uh I can send him this uh this podcast here, sure. you know. Um yeah, I I definitely plan on sharing this with uh with, with 
people I know. Um, so, I mean, sharing this, you know, letting him know, because because he knows me, like I, I'm an introvert. So I'm surprised, honestly, that I've been able to talk for an hour. Um, <laughs> he he is uh he's the yin to my yang so he's he's a talker uh yeah. so so knowing that even i can do something like this uh you know I, I think he'll embrace that um but yeah you know just he he's he's got some um uh some great stories to tell and he's doing sure. some uh some some great things uh, supporting the community uh, up there so um you know yeah if i can get him the uh that you know le letting you know th this is an opportunity to let a wider audience know what you're doing sure, and, and kind of promote those, uh, those good activities that he's doing. Dan, the man Robinson. It yeah. sounds like I, I, I wanted to do a marathon pot. I think I, uh, I think I could do it. I'm talking to a guy who, who did 5 million steps, but uh, yeah, if I had to do a two hour and I break it up into a couple episodes, it sounds like Dan, the man Robinson is the one you said he's a talker. Yeah. Two talkers okay. together and we're going to run. <laughs> Is it, yeah, they'll, they'll run it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, looking forward to that, Brad. This was man, this was so awesome. Like I, I, I I'm trying to be respectful and get off here. Uh, you haven't heard the last of me, Brad Van. We're, we're we're not done here. I I might want to just bring you back with Aaron Carpenter, my forestry guy, and uh, I just would like to just lob some stuff at the both of you, and then see you guys nerd it out, do some stuff, and then, like, add some more. I would love that. That would be a, a really cool thing for me with you two uh, because this is – you know those people that send pictures of cats? Those people right. who wh whip out the pictures of their kids, especially to the single people who don't care? I do that with Aaron. I send him pictures of trees that I'm sure he knows about, but that's – who else can you send it to? That's right. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to go look up sourwood. That sounds so amazing. I'm, gonna, I'm looking that up. It's, yeah. I'm not sure if you guys have them out in Texas, but yeah, if you're out, you know, kind of in, in the east, uh, southeast yeah. part of it, it's, uh, yeah, they're all over the place. So. Yeah. Hey, thanks for coming on. Everyone, uh, that's Brad Brand Brandon. I, I, I don't know how. <laughs> We were lucky enough to get them. I hope you all enjoyed that as much as I did. Please like, subscribe, share. This is a story that has to be told. Thanks again, Brad. This was fun. Good. Yeah. Thanks, Donato. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Oh, great. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks. Yeah. Wow.